Moscow, it's the center of Russia. If you live in Siberia or in Vladivostok, you'd say, I have my apartment in Moscow. It's like, you, you've done something. In 1991, personal income in real terms grew up by 10 times. When they have enough savings, and they spend like, like hell. In a special program, the Luxury Channel goes to Moscow, the world's most exciting luxury destination. Moscow is hot. It has this energy that draws people to it. When you talk about Moscow today with anybody, the most luxury place. We explore the future for the global brands of fashion and design. Versace style was very appropriate for uh, Russian women. So if you're a young designer and you want to make it, look to Russia. And we reveal how designers in Russia are fighting back with their own luxury brands. I think finally Russian fashion will be born. We tell the inside story of the key diamond players in Moscow. We set up our brand and lucky enough today we're number one in this country. Moscow is uh, the third Rome. Smolensk is not just a diamond capital, it's a jewelry capital of Russia as well. We show how the opulent past still shapes Russia today. Historically, Russia was one of the most luxury places. It took us maybe a little longer, but now luxury is back. In just a few years, Moscow has undergone a dramatic transition from drab conformity to super luxury. Yes, in 1991, it was not very pleasant here in Moscow. It was pretty gray. You don't have any goods in the shops at all. Luxury, I would say, or consumption did not exist for many years in this country. Last time polo was played here in Russia was before the 1917 revolution. The Russian economic revolution, if you like, that also changed the whole um, system. Uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of the uh, capitalist Russia. It was a communist country and became more capitalist country than any country in the world. Moscow is a new world capital that is being rediscovered. Clearly these guys are on the leading edge. And just, you know, you see the, the Russian designers and the, the rest of the world is, you know, it looks at Russia in, in a different way from that point of view in terms of lifestyle, you know. There's, there's something there for everybody, from the day life to the night life, from the fashion to the food. This um, art world is extremely dynamic. We are very fond of this city. But bottom line, I think, is the energy is this place tremendous. I suppose it goes back to the Tsars. Somewhere in there is a memory card that has been reactivated even after 70 years of Soviet life. Despite these changes, Russia, the largest country in the world, rich in minerals and natural resources, remains a largely hidden and closed society. The Luxury Channel has filmed with some of the leading figures who are helping to transform modern Russia. We reveal how this new consumer economy has made Moscow one of the richest and most sophisticated cities in the world, home to more than 30 billionaires. Moscow it's became, in a very short time, one of the most expensive cities. Russia's GDP is within the uh, top seven in the, in the world, uh, and it's growing. The oil business is booming, the real estate is booming, because the real estate is booming, the construction is booming. Russia is the single largest car market in Europe today. Not Germany, not Britain, not France, but Russia. Furniture is booming, the restaurant business is booming. Personal income in, in real terms grew up by 10 times. 10 times. The Russian likes to spend money on the good things. They like to live today. They don't save money that for tomorrow. Russia is the third largest creditor of the United States. We were not even in top 50 in 1991. Historically, Russia was one of the most luxury places. It took us maybe a little longer, but now luxury is back. Saturday night at Barvika, 
a luxury shopping village recently built exclusively for rich Muscovites by Mercury, which is the largest luxury retail group in Russia. And I started this um, Mercury business about 15 years ago. It's easy to understand why we decided to build luxury village. Barvika was a very famous residential area, been always famous in Moscow. So automatically, you know, after the perestroika, a lot of Russian people wanted to move to the best area. And how the Barvika happens to be the alleged, very expensive, the best outside area in Moscow. If I didn't have this vision 15 years ago, I probably would never have done what we've done. And I actually pinched myself when the luxury conference was here in Moscow. And all the people get under one roof, the people that I begged to give us the brands, that I went on and on and on and telling them that Moscow is the country where it's deserved to have this luxury brands. So yes, this is, was a winning situation for me right now. The Ritz-Carlton, Moscow's newest luxury hotel. Some 500 top international executives are here for Russia's first supreme luxury conference organized by the International Herald Tribune. Moscow is hot. It's sexy, it's extravagant, it's exciting. And in a world where a lot of capital cities are feeling perhaps just a little tired, it has this energy that draws people to it. Versace was the first international luxury company to set up in Russia in 1992, famous for their bold, iconic designs. It was very different in 91. And to say it was very hard, it was kind of a bold decision. Especially I have to say from the evening wear. And now everything is changing. I describe much more sophisticated than before, much more elegant. Uh, we want really to be in tune with the rest of the world, uh, you know, and we follow fashion very closely. I'm very pleased with that. Big uh, luxury is excellence of design, elegance and glamour. That's luxury today. The luxury brand existed in a rather rarefied realm, outside the trends of what's in. And now all the luxury brands need to expand in emerging markets like Russia. Is the idea of luxury the same in developing nations as it is in developed ones? Is it the same to all people or all cultures? There is tremendous growth potential in emerging markets, and we have seen the creation of wealth increase faster than ever in recorded history. New markets like Russia are the future for global luxury brands. In 1994, there were only three luxury shops selling luxury products at the time, and that was the only fashion industry. There is more luxury goods sold in Moscow than in New York in 2007, which says a lot. In Russia, fur has always been the height of luxury, and now for British designer Julian MacDonald, it's become a very important market. The fur industry has actually saved my business and made it profitable. It's a difficult market to get into, but if you do get it right, it can be very successful. You always get inspired by Russia, by the women, by the architecture, by the art. Women are head to toe in diamonds, fantastic designer gowns and dripping in fur. You know, it's what designers dream, it's what we draw. Here at the Sumptuous State Historical Museum in Red Square, an exclusive party is being held for the Supreme Luxury Conference. It's time for top Russian designers to show their latest creations. Ten years ago, when I started my business in Russia, there was no fashion industry in Russia at all. Russian women, not only for climate reasons, but also because they are really attracted by luxurious things, appreciate furs a lot. They normally buy 
the best quality because they know how to recognize a very good quality sable. And, but also at the same time, they buy the most avant-garde pieces. The market today for luxury goods is a $5 billion market. The reality is also that now they're spending more in Russia, and I think that makes the market so exciting here. I was last here about 12 years ago, and already the change I can see is phenomenal. It's a very informed, intelligent, brand-savvy customer base, and you know we're looking at ways that we can expand in this market. I believe that, that actually they understand the intellectual approach to fashion, which is not necessarily wearing logos from head to foot. People are becoming more discerning about what they buy. They're becoming more uh, sophisticated about what they're buying. Definitely Avashan customers very often are buying the most expensive products. Avashan men are buying for the Russian girls or ladies, while in the most developing markets, the men are buying for themselves. If we move through the history of Russia, we can see that fur was always present. Russia inspires me. Russian themes, Russian women. Although the Soviet era was often very ugly, it was also very modern looking. I do think the Russians are thinking about their heritage as they look forward to the future. Denis Simachev is at the cutting edge of Russia's contemporary design scene, taking his inspiration from USSR-style 90s gangsters. My designs are based around Russian history, the history of Russia and around Russia. I use design elements of the past, principally, first of all, what I consider most important is a sense of humor in the themes I use. There is a likeness in everything I do, a double meaning in all my designs and clothes. My designs are called intellectual and for people who wear it, it isn't only interesting to wear it, but to show it to others. With that is the pleasure of how that thinking reflects on what people wear. I think what will happen to Russian fashion in the future is that it will actually appear as a Russian style. We have fashion from all over the world that will bring out the essence of what Russia is, our uniqueness into the fashion world. The old Russian economy was transformed almost overnight by a group of key bankers locked in meetings in the Kremlin. I was born in Moscow, and Moscow is my city, and I'm, I'm really uh, a Moscowite. I like, I like the city. Troika Dialogue, the company where I work, uh, was uh, established back in 1991. Now it's the major Russian investment bank uh, with $600 billion turnover last year, uh, and um, uh, it is doing uh, a very important work of redistribution of private property as it was designed back in 1991. Like many successful Russian businessmen, Pavel has used his newfound wealth to create a valuable art collection in his home. I collect Russian art, beginning of the 20th century. I buy it from all over the world, mainly from Sotheby's and Christie's, uh, but uh, other places as well. Uh, this uh, Alexander Benoit, who is extremely famous, he was painting Italy and France because he was living there after the revolution. Again, if you look at this, this piece, this is famous Russian Karovin. Uh, it's again, the more, probably one of the most important impressionists. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's, it's Paris. The Oak uh, by um, Pyotr Konchalovsky, extremely important, very similar to Cezanne. If you, uh, they, they work together uh, at the same time doing the same, uh, the same uh, similar stuff. After the break, are diamonds changing Russia forever? The king of diamonds tells his story. We are right at the height of the luxury industry. There's more spendable wealth out there today than I've ever known, and it's lateral. 
we reveal how Crystal is now at the cutting edge of Russian fashion. I think innovation is Swarovski's ticket for the future. Beauty and glamour, this is what we bring to the world. And we discover how the sport of kings has returned to the new Moscow. No other capital in the world you can match what's happening in Moscow these days. In terms of energy, in terms of action, opportunities. But in bottom line, I think the energy in this place is tremendous. The Russian diamond industry is one of the largest and most important in the world. It's a very significant market for the global luxury industry. This country is a very, very rich country. It's full of commodities and, and oil and gas and diamonds and practically everything you could wish for. It's a huge country and it's there. Diamond has a special meaning for Russian women because it's a stone which has a great value, not only in terms of price, you know, but in terms of spirit. Russia is a great country for jewelry and luxury consumption and uh, luxury uh, production as well. Lawrence Graf, the king of diamonds, was one of the first people to set up shop in Moscow 15 years ago. And all these shops that you see, I mean, this place didn't exist at all. And we set up our brand, and lucky enough today we're number one in this country. The price of diamonds have increased tremendously, but it doesn't mean to say they won't increase further. In fact, they will. Um, the reason being, there's more spendable wealth out there today than I've ever known. And it's lateral. It's happening everywhere. We are right at the top of the luxury industry. Russia is one of the best markets for luxury products at this moment. And we found that the Russian people do want quality. And when it comes to jewelry, I have to say they've been basically elegant right from the beginning. They like simplicity and the very finest stones. As we go forward now, there'll be a repetition of the wealth that was pre-communist time. State-owned Smolensk Crystal is one of Russia's most prestigious export companies, and their diamond mines in Siberia are amongst the biggest in the world. Russia is a great country for luxury consumption and uh, luxury uh, production as well. The Smolensk Crystal Diamond Cutting Factory, famous for exceptional quality, is one of the world's largest suppliers of cut diamonds to the luxury industry. Moscow is uh, the third Rome. We've got uh, roots and uh, our religion is from Constantinople, yes, from Byzantium, yes, and in this uh, sense Smolensk is not uh, just a diamond capital, it's a jewelry capital of Russia as well. With Russia's rich heritage, Smolensk has taken elements from the past to reinvent itself. The Dnieper River, yes, in Russia, and uh, Smolensk is a historical hub, yes, uh, from uh, Western to Eastern Europe and from Byzantium to Scandinavia. The major cutting uh, facility was uh, set in, uh, in Smolensk in 1963 by a special uh, government uh, order. We were made uh, to make uh, the perfect diamonds, best diamonds in the world. Yes, and we uh, spent a uh, huge of money during the Soviet time. Yes, and we used uh, space technologies and uh, special uh, army technologies. It was under secret, yes. Russia is important to uh, global diamond uh, industry. About 95% uh, of uh, cut diamonds from Smolensk are exported to Antwerp, uh, to Dubai, to New York, to LA, to Tokyo, to Hong Kong. Smolensk diamonds in diamonds uh, are like Rolls Royces in cars. Now we feel free and uh, people feel free to buy a luxury uh, and to let a luxurious style of life. Uh, are really uh, proud uh, that uh, our jewelry is uh, competitive, yes, and uh, that we have ideas uh, related with our heritage and uh, with the Hermitage collection, with the Russian Seasons, Russian Ballet collection, and with uh, our uh, uh, near uh, past, yes, related with uh, rock and roll. 
Actually, when I was a child, yes, I couldn't imagine that once I'll make a ring and not just a ring, yes, and a goodbye yellow brick, yellow brick road ring with idea to Sir Elton John. Luxury jewelry is all part of the revolution in retail on Red Square. And Cartier, the international icon of contemporary style, is on the front line. We were offered this great location uh, on the Red Square. Red is the color of Cartier, red is the color of passion and love. Known as the jeweler of kings, Cartier's brand is built on a rich and prestigious history. The first clients of Cartier was from 1816, and the first travel of Pierre Cartier in Russia was in 1904. Our first tour was open in 1996, which means that the history of Cartier and Russia has been for a long time re-established. Diamond has a special meaning for Russian women and because it's a stone which has a great value not only in terms of price, you know, but in terms of spirit. Recently, uh, we were requested by our clients, you know, to make orthodox crosses, you know, and this is a way we transform, you know, uh, the, the, the creativity of Cartier, uh, but to fit our clients' request. Before the Russians were traveling, they were flying back to Europe. Now when they want to buy a piece of jewelry or when they want to buy a gift, they want it right here, right now. This is the reason why the market is, uh, is developing so fast. This is the real luxury, to have the freedom to buy whenever they want, which was not the case before. Creativity is here, which means that it's both challenging for the local designers, I would say, to go up to the standards of well, worldwide brand names. But also for us, it's very challenging in our creativity because we have to stay alert and, you know, to look at what the market, how the market is creative in Russia. Swarovski is a historic family-run firm and is now the world's biggest manufacturer of crystal. This is their first major fashion event to be held in Russia. It is run by sixth generation member Nadia Swarovski, who works with the creative avant-garde to give Swarovski crystal cult cred. 20 leading designers are represented here. Well, we know that jewelry has always been the strongest vehicle for self-expression for women, and we, are, we just want to make that self-expression possible. I think Russia has already embraced Swarovski a lot because, yes, it is their first big event. Because Russian women uh, like uh, very beautiful things and Swarovski crystals are very beautiful. <laughs> A new, new start for fashion in Russia because we have a lot of new designers who work also with Swarovski and today we will see it. Well, 10 years ago it was really very difficult to, to make the complete wardrobe in Moscow. Now this is another problem, it's difficult to choose. If earlier Russians were like a little bit overdressed. Now they're okay, they're starting to do the proper choice in the mixes and uh, to express themselves, which is the most important side of fashion. Russian women have got, I think, sort of inborn sophistication deep inside, but it needed time to understand what fashion is and what style is, which is much more important. You know, beauty and glamour, this is what we bring to the world. The idea of this year was to really show this collection in emerging markets. It's amazing to think that every single designer in this show today received the same briefing because every piece is so different one from another. And it really demonstrates the beauty of Swarovski Crystal and the versatility of its use.
In a surprising throwback to the days of the Sars, snow polo, the sport of kings, is now established as part of new Moscow's opulent lifestyle. We brought polo back to Russia in uh, 2003. Here in our club, the Russian Polo Club, we have stables for about uh, 48 horses. Last time polo was played here in Russia was before the 1917 revolution. So it was, it was for me it was a great pleasure as a foreigner, although I've lived here for a long time, to you know, bring this great sport back to Russia. You can imagine for Russia, polo on snow it's it fits it fits very well. The snow, the, the fur, the vodka, the caviar, and the horses on the snow is actually quite a pretty sight. I still amaze myself. I come back and I just watch, watch the people change so fast and so much happening, you know, that energy is so, so tremendous. And clearly, in like anywhere on the world, you have the, the new money that at the beginning looks for labels and paying anything that's the most expensive thing, you know. Now, like more old money, begins to become more conservative. No other capital in the world you can match what's happening in Moscow at this stage. In terms of energy, in terms of action, opportunities, in terms of, of the way this market is developing and the closeness that Russia has to the European, the Western mentality. You know, it's a very, very unique mix. With Russia, people feel a lot more comfortable, so they feel that change much better.